Hey everyone, welcome to Things We Said Today, a bi-weekly Beatles podcast, where we discuss anything and everything about the Beatles, together and solo, and all things Beatle-related. Um, I'm Darren DeVivo, I'm one of the three hosts of Things We Said Today. I'm from WFUV Radio in New York City uh, at 90.7 FM, and you don't have to be in the New York City metropolitan area to listen because you can stream us at WFUV.org, and you can also download our app and listen there. So I'm part of WFUV now for not quite close to 40 years, and it uh, gives me great pleasure to hang out with you guys every other week and hang out with my co-hosts. Ken Michaels has been uh, hosting Beatles radio programs now for roughly, slightly more, but roughly the same amount of time I've been broadcasting. Uh, Ken currently is the host of the syndicated radio program, um, Every Little Thing. And also he co-hosts another podcast slash video cast, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And there's Ken Michaels Radio over on YouTube, uh, where you could check out interviews and all kinds of cooking demonstrations that Ken has done. Uh, (laughs) Uh, and, uh, so that's Ken Michaels and he's one of the hosts. How are you, Ken? Good. No cooking though. Uh, and, I- and your website is kenmichaelsradio.com, right? Yes. That's so the name of the YouTube channel and it's the website. Uh, <laughs> our other host is, uh, one of music's finest, uh, critics, journalist, author, Alan Kozin. Uh, oddly enough, Alan's been writing professionally for a little more than 40 years. I don't know what is it with us in the 40, but uh, Alan was at the New York Times for a period of time, still can be seen in the Times, the Wall Street Journal. Um, He's written several books on the Beatles. He's written several classical music uh, books and reference guides. But all the focus these days is on the upcoming Paul McCartney biography, part one. And uh, it's called The McCartney Legacy, volume one, 1969 to 1973. Uh, written by Alan and also Adrian Sinclair, um, Sinclair, excuse me. And what is the publishing date? Because I know it's now into November. December 13th. December 13th. So that's the McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 1973. Adrian Sinclair and our co-host, Alan Cozen. How are you, Alan? Great, Darren. How are you doing? All right. Now, today's show, we are going to, they should put the camera on I. I'm looking at myself and it looks like I'm looking down. The camera's up here. Put the camera down there. Wouldn't that make more sense? Then I'd be looking up here. Anyway, today's show is going to be a focus on a favorite album of ours. I'll tell you which one uh, in a little bit. And we'll kind of kind of put discuss its place in history, not only Beatle history, but music history. But first, it's news time. So over to Ken we go. Hey, Ken. All right. Thank you, Darren. First of all, we have to announce, in case you haven't heard since um, this happened a few days ago, the passing of John Eastman, who was Paul McCartney's brother-in-law, Linda McCartney's brother. And um, as we all know, towards the end of the Beatles, there was a bit of a feud going on within the group that uh, John, George and Ringo wanted Alan Klein to become their manager. Uh, their business manager, and Paul wanted his in-laws to represent the group. And I know that um, Alan posted something really wonderful on our Things We Said Today Facebook page, all about John Eastman and uh, his major contributions to Paul's career. And I thought maybe you'd like to share that with us, Alan. Yeah, I mean, you you can't really um, overstate john eastman's importance in paul's life and career and and that of his his father lee eastman um you know at the time they were eastman and eastman eastman and eastman still exists uh uh and and, until john eastman's death it was really him and his son who was also named lee um and the second lee eastman is now has been increasingly handling paul's work but basically any legal thing that paul had to do any contract he had to make not to mention things like acquisitions of um publishing catalogs you know uh that kind of thing that was all through the eastmans and specifically john because um 
John was, you know, a couple of years, three years older, really, than Paul. Um, but he was, you know, much closer to Paul's age than Lee Eastman was. Um, at the time that he got involved with Paul and the Beatles, he had actually only been part of Eastman and Eastman for four years. He graduated from NYU Law School in 1964 and joined what was then Eastman and De Silva, um, his father's firm. And his father had, you know, for a long time specialized in entertainment law. Um, you know, the composer Jack Lawrence wrote the song Linda, which is, you know, I mean, Sinatra's covered it, everybody's done it. And it was written for Linda when she was really a, a baby. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, uh, the first time Paul went to Linda's place in New York in October 68, um, which would have been when he met the Eastmans, the, the you know, brother and father and, and her two sisters. Um, Linda had the manuscript of that song framed on her wall. Um, you know, they also represented artists, Villain de Koning, um, uh, oddly enough, um, Andrew Lloyd Webber. I can't think why. I guess, you know, I guess if you're representing one of the best, you also have to sort of counterbalance it with Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> Billy Joel. <laughs> and, <laughs> and in fact, they also for a while represented Grand Funk Railroad. Uh, um, John Eastman represented Jim Guercio as well. And in fact, this is another, another element of the importance of John Eastman, who, you know, you don't hear about a lot because he's the ultimate background guy. He did not look for publicity or anything, but it was John Eastman's idea um, after the McCartney album came out and uh, got panned a lot in the press, which depressed Paul, you know, not as much as breaking up from the Beatles depressed him, but he was a little, you know, come on, you know, give me a break. And John Eastman suggested, why don't you come to New York? You know, it'll take you out of your comfort zone. And, uh, you know, you can work with um, some of the best studio musicians in the best studios, you know, and, and I can help arrange that because, you know, he knew um, a lot of people in the New York music world uh, halfway through. Well, more than halfway through. But um, after a few months of recording Ram, when it was sort of going slowly and Paul was sort of like continuing to overdub and not finishing. Um, every, everybody was a little sort of worried about, you know, what's going on with this. And John Eastman suggested, why don't you go to LA and maybe, um, work with a producer. And one of his clients was Jim Guercio, who had produced the Chicago albums. And, uh, at that point he had produced the second Blood, Sweat and Tears album, um, and so he was sort of, a, you know, a big successful producer. And so he put Paul together with Guercio. Um, that didn't really work out because Paul really, particularly at the time, wanted to self-produce. Um, and there were all kinds of reasons which um, you can read about in December when the book comes out. Um, but, you know, way, getting way beyond where the book goes to, which is only 73, <laughs> excuse me. Um, when Paul moved to Columbia, obviously John Eastman, as his lawyer, would have negotiated that contract. When he moved back to Capitol, he negotiated that. So really anything that Paul did in a business way, you know, including buying publishing catalogs, you name it, it all went through the Eastmans and particularly John Eastman. So, you know, and in addition, as you could tell from um, if, if anybody hasn't seen Paul's tweet and Instagram message um, about John Eastman, you know, they were they were close friends and, uh, it, you know, it wasn't just a business relationship. Um, so, you know, he's he was a very important figure in Paul's life that an awful lot of people don't even know. So, yeah, he really helped to help Paul be one of the wealthiest people in the entertainment industry. Yeah. With all the um, advice given for music publishing. When Paul signed with CBS, wasn't part of the deal that he acquired some other catalogs to yes. go with? Yes, CBS owned a catalog that they um, transferred to Paul um, as part of that, as part of the, let's call it a signing bonus. But yeah, I can't remember which catalog actually it's because uh, that's, that's in the next volume, which I'm working on now. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what potentially, I know it's guessing, but potentially 
what um, what influence, what would have happened, you think, to the Beatles had they, the other three Beatles agreed, okay, let's go with the Eastmans and not Alan Klein. Um, if the Eastmans were managing uh, the Beatles. You know, I think what would have happened... <laughs> What they were afraid of, you know, like what anybody would be afraid of yes. if you're in a partnership and one of them wants his in-laws is that, you know, the in-laws might favor you. I mean, that wasn't my impression of how the Eastman's operated. The way I see it is, you know, they would have given the same advice they gave to Paul, they would have given to all of them. And they probably all would have been immensely wealthy on Paul's level. Um, but in the end, they had to sue Klein, Klein sued them, they sued Klein, you know, it's the, the whole sue me, sue you blues thing, um, you know, and in the end, when in 1973, when they decided not to renew Klein's contract, John said in a number of interviews, first, he said, you know, I think, um, I think probably Paul was right with his suspicions of Klein. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, you know, by by the time they decided not to re-sign with Klein, um, the Rolling Stones, who had um, recommended Klein originally, had reconsidered Klein because they found out that behind their backs, he had acquired all their master tapes up through 1971 and all of their music publishing. He owned all of that. And they were not happy about that. And they tried to warn the Beatles. And at that point, John wasn't listening, which was a, another point of irritation for Paul. But someone asked John when um, when they didn't renew with Klein, you know, do you do you think um, you would have ended up like the Rolling Stones, you know, with him owning your tapes and and publishing? And John said, um, because the Eastmans were always looking over our shoulders and Klein's shoulders, that prevented that from happening. And uh, he said, you know, and, and also we were really playing one against the other, so it wasn't going to happen. So it's kind of interesting that, you know, all of this um, tourists, as we say, <laughs> about, you know, uh, the, the, the battles between John, George, and Ringo on one side, and Paul on the other. You know, John was by 1973 looking back and saying, "Yeah, that actually saved us." You know, so wow. yeah, I kind of, I kind of think, I, I kind of think they would have been okay um, if they had gone with the Eastmans, um, just because they, you know, they made Paul an incredibly rich man, as you said, and um, I. I don't think, you know, if they had done that for the others, too, it wouldn't have cost Paul anything. You know, it would have been just like, OK, this is our advice about how to invest. Mm -hmm. so do it, <laughs> you know, and if they did it, it probably would have been good for them. Yeah. You know, it's, it's often talked about how wealthy Paul is, but um, yes, he's made a lot of money from the sales of Beatle records and his solo records and his tours. but it's my impression that the vast majority of the money that he's made has been from music publishing. Yeah. So for that, you really have to thank the Eastman's mm -hmm. and whether or not John George or Ringo would have followed suit and had the same kind of interest that Paul did with music publishing remains to be seen. But well, you know, their advice was not by music publishing. Their advice was by whatever it is that you're passionate about. And that's what they did. You know, they were passionate about art. They had a, an apartment full of Picassos and Matisse's and, and all this stuff. That was what they bought. And that made them very wealthy. I mean, John Eastman just a couple of years ago bought a um, $27 million apartment in Manhattan. So, you know, they've done pretty well. Hmm. Interesting. And, you know, in the case of music publishing, I just know that, I'm pretty sure the very first catalog that Paul acquired was Buddy Holly's. Mm -hmm. But he did that mainly because he loved Buddy Holly. <laughs> right. It wasn't just he wasn't just thinking how much money can I make, you know. I'm, I'm sure that he was he wanted to protect that catalog and make sure that it was well represented. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Anyway, so very sad to hear about John Eastman. Yeah. Other major passings of note will follow in the news. Hmm. McCartney 1, 2, and 3, the box set is being offered now in three limited edition formats. A three album colored vinyl, a three album black vinyl, and a three CD version. Each includes three special photo prints with notes from Paul about the album. And all three albums are available to stream in Dolby Atmos, a way to hear the music in 3D. It was mixed by Giles Martin and Steve Orchard and mastered by Emily Lazar. You can listen to the music from these three albums on Amazon Music HD. Apple Music and Title. Did either of you get the box set? I did. Okay. Which I version? Got, I got the CD in the black vinyl. I didn't get the colored vinyl. Okay. And did you listen to it in um, Dolby Atmos? Uh, yeah, I have. And in fact, um, you know, the Dolby Atmos for those records um, breaks down to 12 channels. And listening to the channels individually is um, pretty interesting. For instance, we were talking when we did uh, the thing the other a few episodes ago about um, uh, sort of sleeper tracks of Paul's, um, and I had picked Karina Crory. Mm -hmm. Okay. In Karina Crory, there are things like, you know, he wanted a stampede sound, so he sort of ended up drumming with his fingers on, a, on an instrument case. Well, they have that on a separate channel. <laughs> They have the fire that he built, you know, to get crackling fire sounds in there. You can hear, you know, things that you don't really hear in the full track because they're mixed together and, and you know, you're not necessarily supposed to hear it all. Um, you hear the, the arrow flying by. A um, lot of stuff in this 12 track version. And um, maybe I'm amazed, you know, you solo the vocal for that. It's just incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, you hear bits of guitar lines that, you know, I don't remember hearing in the full track. I mean, they're probably in there, but they're like secondary lines. So they're supporting the, the main thing. But, you know, it's kind of interesting to hear all the little stuff he does. Um, so if you um, if you can get the Dolby Atmos and get um, separations somehow or other, um, it's it's very rewarding. Just and they, but they're making the Atmos available through the stream. Most people are not going to have right uh, twelve channels, right? So, like, you, oh, stream! I'm running through my little Bluetooth speaker. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to take advantage of uh, of, yeah. of of of, of here, sampling this, if, if nothing else. Right. What you need to do is <clears throat> somehow. Uh, download them and figure out how to do the separations, which I haven't had to do. Someone did it and um, I listened to them, but, uh, but there were ways to do it. I, I, I'm not really, I, I'm sure if you go on to Google and ask, how does one separate the streams from an Atmos track? Um, you'll find an answer. Hmm. I'm just I'm not understanding why they don't make this available on the vinyl and CD. Probably because they're not capable of holding 12 channels. I, I don't know. Okay. This is all new to me. I'm not that technical. So <laughs> I right. just cleaned the heads on my eight track player. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm I don't have an eight track. Mark Lewison is in the news. He's keeping busy, not only working on his follow-up to his book, Tune In, but with a new project. He gave an interview for the podcast show, Word in Your Ear, in which he revealed that in October, he'll be doing three shows in London at the Bloomsbury Theater called Evolver 62. And in it, he tells 62 short stories about the year 1962 as part of the Beatles story. Each of the short stories is about two minutes long. The show itself is broken up in two parts, each one running approximately 62 minutes. And um, the three shows will run on October the 7th for one show and two shows on October the 8th. It's Not only go, that, if you go on to his Twitter page, he has samples of a bunch of them. And they're really interesting. Just I was about to say it's on YouTube as well. 
Oh yeah. Oh, okay. He's posted shows. And again, they're all about two minutes long. They're all very entertaining. And um, if you want to find out more about the shows, you can look at the tour's website at beatlesevolver.com. And be sure to check out Mark's interview on that podcast called Word in Your Ear. And you can also visit Mark's own website at marklewison.net. Okay, congratulations are in store to Beatles author Jerry Hammack, whose series of books, The Beatles Recording Reference Manuals, Volumes 1 through 5, have all been added to the permanent collection of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Library and Archives. Very nice. Bruce Spizer's latest, Rubber Soul to Revolver, is now available for pre-order, which you can do on his website, beetle.net. The official release date, as it's listed on Amazon for that, is October the 10th. Just released is a new book called Top of the Mountain, The Beatles at Shea Stadium 1965 by Laurie Jacobson. And we are just we just surpassed the anniversary for that. And we have some passings here to note. First of all, there's Mo Austin. Mo is an American record executive who worked for many record companies, Verve, Warner Brothers, Reprise, and DreamWorks. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2003 by Paul Simon, Lauren Michaels, and Neil Young. Mo was responsible for signing the Kinks to Reprise Records and Jimi Hendrix after seeing him perform at the Monterey Pop Festival. Other impressive acts he signed were Neil Young, Paul Simon, Jody Mitchell, Fleetwood Mac, Randy Newman, The Grateful Dead, R.E.M., Madonna, Tom Petty, Talking Heads, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And now, Mike Mo, McGear. what's that? And Mike McGear. He did? Yeah, the McGear album. Okay. Signed. Add that to the list. Yep. Thank you, Mo. He must have formed some friendship with George Harrison whose Dark Horse Records was distributed by Warner Brothers, as George wrote a tribute song to Moe, which over the years has been bootlegged. It was first issued on a four-album set in 1978 of various Warner Brothers artists contributing songs for a tribute album, which was only issued as a promotional item in a box set. George's song, simply titled Mo, M-O, was one of them. It's a really nice song with um, typical great slide guitar work from George Harrison. It's also the shortest title of any song written by any of the Beatles with just two letters. Mo Austin, God bless him, he was 95. I love that song, Mo. Wish it came out officially. Maybe someday it will. Uh, you gonna say something? If Ringo decides to follow up why not with why and just spell it why, then he can break George's record for. Okay. okay. If we get to interview Ringo, we'll bring that up to him. <laughs> I'm sure that's a serious consideration for him. Uh, obviously, one of the biggest names we lost in the past week was Olivia Newton-John. Without question, one of the most successful female artists of all time having massive hits in the 70s and 80s, as well as being known for playing Sandy in the now iconic film, Grease. It is certainly worth uh, noting that early in her career, she recorded three songs that were all recorded by George Harrison for his All Things Must Pass album. She recorded If Not For You. And although the song was written by Bob Dylan, Olivia's version was close to George's arrangement of the song. That recording was a no number seven hit in the UK and her first top 40 hit in the U.S., peaking at number 25. She also recorded What Is Life, which made it to number 16 on the U.K. charts, number 34 on the U.S. adult contemporary charts. And while it wasn't released as a single, Olivia covered Behind That Locked Door. Both What Is Life and Behind That Locked Door appeared on her 1972 album, Olivia. And earlier in her career in 1968, she performed Here, There, and Everywhere on Australia's TV version of Bandstand. She also covered The Long and Winding Road on her 1976 album, Come On Over. Definitely one of my favorite singers of all time, Olivia Newton-John. Yeah, I've, I was never really much, uh, I didn't really follow her music all that well, uh, mm -hmm. other than the hits, but She's part of the soundtrack. To, you grew up in the 70s and 
in the eighties, he was part of your soundtrack and, um, it was very sad to hear the news of her passing. Uh, I know my wife is a big fan of the movie Xanadu, and she was in that as well. So, you know, she's such a, an important part. Right. You know, folks my age, our age, um, you know, it was very sad to hear of her passing. I could be here a long time if I listed all the songs I love from her, but most of the major hits and some of the smaller hits, the duet she made with uh cliff richard andy gibb obviously john travolta they're all favorites of mine uh she will be definitely missed um also i should mention judith durham who was the lead singer of the seekers even though she there's really no connection between the seekers and the mm -hmm. beatles if you grew up in the 60s or oldies radio after that if you love the songs georgie girl a world of <laughs> our own yeah i'll never find another you what a powerful vocalist Judith Durham was. And ironically, two singers there, Olivia and Judith, really known for, you know, her their lives in, in Australia. Big names in Australia. Um, and we also lost a member of one of the most successful songwriting teams of the 60s, and that's Lamont Dozier. Yeah. The mm -hmm. famous Holland Dozier Holland team. They wrote many classic songs from Motown, including 10 songs for the Supremes that all went to number one. And the Beatles, of course, were major fans of Motown artists. Ringo did cover the Supreme set Where Did Our Love Go on his Bad Boy album. Lennon and McCartney were the most successful songwriters of the 60s. Holland Dozier Holland would be right up there, too. And um, some reminders of release dates coming up. Julian Lennon's new album, Jude, comes out September the 9th. Ringo Starr's new EP, EP3, will be coming out the next week, September 16th, on CD and digitally. And as it has been rumored, John and Yoko's Sometime in New York City, the archival box set should be coming out, we hope, on John's birthday, October the 9th. And then sometime in October, Again, we hope the box set for Revolver. And uh, that's all the news I have for you. And I like the way you ended it there with mentioning Revolver because today's show is going to be about Revolver. Uh, as we look back uh, 56 years, which has got to be mind boggling for the folks mm -hmm. that can remember buying Revolver mm -hmm. uh, when it was brand new. But 56 years ago this month, uh, Revolver came out, and it's an album that has always been praised uh, as one of the Beatles' best. But years ago, decades ago, and I remember this growing up in the 70s, that whenever a publication or a radio station did a countdown of the best albums, whether they were of all time or of a certain era, the Beatle album that always got the recognition with Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Now, at some point, that slowly started to change. Was it a little Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band overkill that sometimes, some, some, not sometimes, somewhere along the line, opinions started to change. And maybe people started to, maybe it was when the uh, Beatle albums came out on CD and everybody was reassessing and re-listening again that the opinion started to pop around that perhaps something else is the Beatles' finest album. And I would think that maybe the White Album, definitely Revolver, are the two that you hear mentioned the most as being personal favorites or this is the best album that they've done, not Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So we thought we would talk about a Revolver and our experiences with it, our opinions of it, and its place. Uh, in Beatle history and and the music history in general, so um, not not to, to bring age up in this, but I do want to start with Alan because <laughs> you probably remember hearing it for the first time, or at least bringing it home, and maybe not all of your initial impressions of Revolver. But I would love—I've said this before—I would love to have been a fly on the wall for uh, any Beatle fan the day they brought Revolver home and, and see their reaction to this because they were maturing with every record that they did. That was obvious. 
some albums a little more than others, but they were always moving forward and progressing. Revolver must have been like having your head blown off hearing that because they just took the ball and ran with it. Yeah, but you know, it, it wasn't. Um, you expected everything that they put out to be different and new and interesting and have sounds that weren't on the previous one. Um, and, and so it's sort of interesting because years ago when we had Candy Leonard on um, to talk about her book, Beatleness, um, she talked about how Beatles fans at the time or, or people have told her that at the time they put on Revolver and they found it scary. And I was really kind of surprised to hear that because it wasn't my experience. Um, so um, probably if you if you you want to fly on the wall of, you know, someone hearing it and being like, well, how do I deal with this? Um, you got to talk to one of the people Canty interviewed. Um, you know, keep in mind that by the time it came out, well, we already knew Yellow Submarine. Um, and we already knew Eleanor Rigby because it was the backy yellow submarine. So there were those two. Um, for you know, we we now we now listen to the British album mostly, which you know has this track listing. But three of these tracks, um, "I'm Only Sleeping," "And Your Bird Can Sing," and "Doctor Robert, Robert," had been taken off the American one and were on yesterday and today which we got in june and this came out in august so we're already sort of being you know if you look at it this way we now have already heard five of the revolver tracks if you count yellow submarine and and ellen and ellen rigby added to those three so the sound world that the Beatles were going to give us we were already kind of sliding into a little bit you know i'm only sleeping as you know backwards guitar and and your bird can sing has the you know the doubled guitar figure going all the way through it all of that was was kind of new for the Beatles, uh, although, you know, we had backwards stuff in rain by then, which was out earlier in the summer of 66. Uh, so. But, yeah, you know, backwards stuff, definitely it sounded, you know, kind of spacey and weird. You could but you knew what it was when you heard it. You knew it was backwards. Um, and it's like, oh, hey, that's a cool effect. The Beatles are doing something cool. What a big surprise, you know. So it, it was um, it just was less surprising than you might think, it, it, at least for me and my friends. But there were things like, you know, she said, she said, I know what it's like to be dead. I mean, that was a little bit freaky to hear for the first time. Um, Tomorrow never knows must have been. Yeah, yeah. And tomorrow never knows, uh, you know, both those two, those two, those two side enders, you know, those were a little bit strange um, to listen to, but in a way, not that surprising. It's like, okay, this is where they've gotten to. The other thing that was a little bit strange was um, like, love you too, with the six bar. Um, uh, it, it was a little surprising to us, I think, that this album had not one, not two, but three George Harrison songs, you know. Um, you know, but so so at the time, I, I'm not sure, you know, if I if I, if I was that shocked by it, I don't remember it, you know, but um, hearing hearing it since then, you know, I mean, listening to I listened to it again the other day since we're talking about it. And, you know, one of the things that struck me that I don't think I really ever thought in terms of before is that um, instrumentally, it, 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 it may be their tightest, most virtuosic kind of album not showy virtuosity but you know you listen to those you know twin guitars going in and your bird can sing you know that's that's something and uh really all of it you listen to dr robert you know um there's there's just an awful lot of um really good tight playing on that album um, you know, and then you got, you know, for no one and here, there and everywhere, you've got these two absolutely gorgeous Paul McCartney love songs, you know, got a French horn, you know, on, on one of them. So, 
Yeah, there were just a lot of sounds. Um, but we were getting used to hearing unusual sounds from them. So, um, you know, that's just how it was. Do, do you recall a friend's reaction or something that maybe was uh, was the opposite of yours or somebody else who, you know, a friend of a friend or someone like that or your girlfriend's brother or something <laughs> that hated the new direction and what are these guys doing or anything, you know, that, that, that kind of pops into your head. I don't really remember anything like that because <clears throat> all of my friends were pretty much all in on Beatles stuff, you know, like we waited for it and we were never disappointed by it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, our, I think our approach was not to say, Hmm, do I like this or don't I like this? It was more like, okay, this is unusual. Let's come to terms with it. What's great about this? You know, we, right. I like that guitar. I like that, you know, and, and, and it really, uh, it really didn't even strike us as, uh, you know, something to rebel against. It, it just was more like something to come to terms with. Oh. Interesting. Hmm. Now, Ken, you would have been, Pretty early on, you were pretty young, but the album itself was probably a few years old, at least, give or take, whatever, uh, when you first uh, discovered Revolver. Uh, how do you remember when it came? You don't remember when it came out. Do you, you would have? No, but I, I know for a fact that being brought up by the American albums first, right. I had all the albums fairly close to their release dates. Maybe not the day that they came out, but pretty close to it. So, yeah, I would have heard Revolver in 1966. And, you know, there's so many That's things Alan, that Alan said there that, you know, I would certainly repeat because when I listen to Revolver now, the British album, I'm totally blown away by it. And I hear a radical difference between Rubber Soul and Revolver. Yeah, but yeah. I know that it, it suddenly it became this epiphany for me. Which, which Alan just repeated, probably when I was a, a little kid, how much can you analyze at the age of six or seven? I was used to the evolution of the Beatles. It all sounded very natural to me. Once in a while, there'd be a really strange song. I always thought I Am the Walrus was completely weird mm -hmm. and A Day in the Life scared the hell out of me <laughs> when it first came out. Um, but I'm sure Tomorrow Never Knows I would have thought was a little bit weird. But because of the fact that we had those three songs on yesterday and today, we got a taste of what was to come. So I think the evolution of the Beatles was a, a smoother one for us, for Americans, even though I was only seven at the time when that happened. Um, yeah, but uh, I, I'm very interested nowadays. I'm sure that the album was praised like every Beatles album was, but most of my life, I remember hearing that Sgt. Pepper is the greatest album of all time. And now, and, and we can get into this discussion as to why Revolver, I think, is certainly, you know, given so much more acclaim. Um, and I think it's been for several decades now. But I, I think that, um, you know, so much attention was given to Sgt. Pepper. And... I wanted to bring up this thing about, as we've been told many times over, Brian Wilson was blown away by Rubber Soul to the point where that was a big influence on Pet Sounds. Pet Sounds influenced the Beatles and especially Paul, and that influenced Sgt. Pepper. Mm -hmm. But you never hear about Revolver, which was right in the middle of all of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, the only thing that I do know is that here, there, and everywhere... Paul said he was influenced by God only knows. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, weren't the beach boys. Didn't they love revolver too? <laughs> you know, you, you, I'm only well, going to Brian Wilson said. When did, um, that's a good point because you always hear that rubber soul influenced uh, pet sounds, hmm. pet sounds. Sergeant pepper is right. And Sergeant Pepper, when Brian heard that, I mean, you know, he just thought, all right, that's it. I'm done. I'm out. Yeah. But you don't, you, you're right. I never thought of that. Revolver is not in the equation 
perhaps because they were released on top of one another. Uh, Pet Sounds came out in May. So I got to count with two fingers. How many months to August? That's two months. Uh-huh. Hey, three months. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. You don't, you don't get the revolver Pet Sounds connection. It goes Rubber Soul, Pet Sound, Sergeant Pepper. But um, Revolver, I think, was really lost in the shuffle. And I think part of the reason is because Revolver didn't come out in America the way it came out in the UK. If we heard it that way with 14 tracks Mm -hmm. and the US version had five McCartney songs and two Lennon songs, Mm -hmm. you know, there was more Harrison songs than there were Lennon songs. But if you heard it as it came out in the UK, that's the American one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we might have had a different reaction to Revolver if it came out as it did in the UK. It was a much more balanced album. Five Lennon, five McCartney, three Harrison, uh-huh. and Yellow Submarine, which essentially is Paul's song. But, um, yeah, but because of that, I think we were more blown away by Sgt. Pepper. But I think that there was just so much innovation that was done on Revolver, which you can feel so much more absorb so much more when you're listening to the uk version Mm -hmm. that's just my you know Mm -hmm. my opinion there when 1987 happened and all the beatles albums came out on cd up until then i only had a few beatles imports so i was used to the american versions once i started listening to it from please please me on the way they released it the uk you get a different impression oh yeah of the catalog Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whereas, you know, 1964, we're catching up with all the music for the last year and a half of the Beatles. And we all know the story, how everything came out in America and you got less tracks and it wasn't exactly the way the Beatles had planned them on their albums. But once you hear them the way that they released it, you have more of an appreciation for the growth of the band, mm. you know, as they released their albums and singles in that chronological order. Revolver is, is probably the worst of the American albums um, because the only difference about it is it's missing three songs. Whereas with, with all of the others, you can probably come up with some justification about why you like the American one. Um, you know, meet the Beatles, um, you know, jettisons the covers and is most of the covers and is almost all original, which is a great way to introduce them. Um, Beatles second album has, has a lot more of the covers and it's a, you know, very rocky album and, you know, and it has hits like she loves you, you know, and so on, even with, you know, rubber soul where capital did some serious messing about like by taking tracks from help, the British help and putting it there, you know, it makes it into a more acoustic album than the real one. And, Mm -hmm. you know, has that opening, I've just seen a face, which is a great opening track um, and is lost on the British help. So all of these, you can, you can make some kind of case. There's no way you can make a case for the American revolver. There's simply nothing good to be said about it, except that, it's the rest of the album and it's really good. But if you want the whole album, you got to get the British one. Because right. mm. it's shorter. That's it. Yeah. You know. And you weren't aware of the fact back in 66, unless you were, a, a, dare I say, a scholar, getting records from England and, and comparing and seeing these big differences uh, that were, you know, with the albums in the two countries, you weren't aware of the fact that Yesterday and today had three songs that were supposed to be revolver songs. And yesterday and today was, wow, the new Beatle album. Right. Wow, revolver's the new Beatle album. You know. Yeah. Uh, all of this, unfortunately, is lost on me because, as I've said a number of times on this show, I grew, I discovered the Beatles slowly through the 70s, but was more tuned into the solo stuff uh, first. And a lot of times it was, Christmas time for me when I would get his gifts when I started to show that I was a fan of the Beatles during the earlier part of the 70s and I was into music and I was into records that became the thing to get Darren like 
you call up my mom and go, what does Darren want for Christmas? Mm-hmm. Well, you can never go wrong with a Beatle record or a Paul McCartney record or something. I'm assuming that that was. And then every Christmas, it was like something new. Most of the times, they were albums I'd never seen before. And um, I remember it took me a few minutes to figure what the heck Magical Mystery Tour was. I had never seen that before. And there's there's animals in the cover. Who are these people? <laughs> and what is this? What? Who? Mm-hmm. Oh, th- that's the Beatles? Okay. I mean, I was finding, I was getting these things. And I always remember Revolver. Revolver was an album that confused me a little because I think I had the Yellow Submarine album. In fact, I know I had the Yellow Submarine album first when I was, I remember getting it as a, as a kind of a present when I had my tonsils removed. I was seven. 1972, I got Yellow Submarine and Yellow Submarine, the songs on that album. So for me, Yellow Submarine is on Yellow Submarine. What's, why does Revolver have the same song? I was going backwards, you know, and piecing this all together and using that um, that giveaway flyer that came with the blue and red albums that had the discographies listed out uh, as a guide to trying to figure out what belonged where and what year. And, you know, there would be there was a couple of errors on them that didn't jive. Um but that was how it all, I pieced it all together. So to me, by the time I sat down from beginning to end and listened to Revolver, I was already well aware of probably most of the Beatle albums. I think Revolver was one of the last ones I came to. Hmm. And I can only assume that maybe it was because Yellow Submarine, I knew it's on Yellow Submarine. I, you know, we'll get that next. I'll, uh, I'll get that album next. I don't remember getting Revolver, and I think my copy, I always go by the label design by trying to fi- piece, figure out where my, when I got my Beatle records. And my Revolver is on the Purple Capital. So, you know, it was a little later in the 70s. So a lot of the innovation was lost on me, uh, only until I got older and acquired everything on CD. Yeah, I have that now, but, you know, when the, the, some of the earlier Beatle records that I got as gifts in the mid-70s, Help, Rubber Soul, Yesterday and Today, Magical Mystery Tour, those come to mind immediately. They were on Apple, mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, and, but Revolver was on the Purple Capital, so uh, that's later in the 70s for me. So, in a way, I kind of uh, feel a little, like, left out that I didn't hear things chronologically and get to really appreciate the maturity with my own ears without the experts today like us that are all over the internet and in books that are kind of guiding us through the music today. Um, Revolver was one of the first CDs that I, that I bought. Um, And I was, I'm old fashioned. Uh, I still do the same thing today. I was very hesitant with CDs. I didn't want to hear from CDs. I was an LP. I was a vinyl guy. Um, but uh, I had a CD player purchased for me as a graduation gift from college. And I had no choice but to test the waters of this new technology. So, all right, what do I buy? I'm going to the store. And I'm like, all right, the Beatle albums are coming out on CD. You know, and I don't have enough money yet to buy them all. <laughs> Today, it's like, <laughs> I get three copies of each. Keep one sealed. One doesn't see daylight. And the other gets open. But back then, it was pick one. And Revolver was probably, uh, probably was one of the, because uh, they were coming out in, in, in series. Um, and Revolver was probably part of the most recent at that time. And I thought, you know what? I don't really have. It's probably one of the albums I've spent the least amount of time with, and it probably is dynamite on CD. So it was, you know, I was very aware at 23, I'd like to believe, of or 22, of uh, Re- Revolver's Place. Revolver was the first album engineered by Jeff Emery. Right. And I think that also. 
um, besides the Beatles maturing and their own abilities to be innovative, having Jeff Emmerich as their recording engineer, I think helped push Revolver as well, maybe a little further from Rubber Soul than some of the other albums helped the Rubber Soul. The jump was a little less. Um, right. But Rubber Soul to Revolver, I always thought, you know what, that some of that was Jeff Emmerich. John wanting to sound like, what was the, uh, the Dalai Lama on a hill, mm-hmm. on a mountaintop for Tomorrow Never Knows. Jeff Emmerich, well, why don't we dangle a mic from the ceiling? Okay. You know, and all kinds of other things. How about we put the microphone in the toilet tank <laughs> and have you go down the hall? You know, these are the types of things uh, that Jeff Emmerich was coming up with that helped aid the Beatles in seeing their what they heard in their head, seeing it through onto vinyl. Yeah, well, I think one of the things that Jeff Emmerich did, which was so instrumental with Revolver, was the close miking technique, mm-hmm. of everything that he recorded. And he's right up front recording the strings on Eleanor Rigby, and right up front recording the Indian instruments on Love You Too, and the brass on Got to Get You Into My Life, you know? A lot of what you were saying there, you got to give George Martin a lot of credit too, of oh, course, yeah. obviously. Yeah, yeah. But um, putting John's voice through a Leslie speaker on Tomorrow Never Knows, you know, that's because um, John went to George Martin and said that's what he wanted. So how do you translate that into sound? George Martin had to come up with something. So, yeah, Jeff Emmerich deserves a ton of credit, obviously. But, uh, you know, George Martin does too, always. <laughs> And age, of course, I'm sure played into it because Jeff, Jeff Emmerich was actually younger than the Beatles. So mind was working in a different way. And he's not worried about, I guess, what the uh, uh, the technicians and the head engineers at Abbey Road were saying about how the equipment must be treated and the whole the, the uh, restrictions put upon them. You know, let, I think it'd be really cool to take this microphone and bury it under the floorboards and... <laughs> Uh, you know, see what that sounds like and running a r- running a vocal through um, the Leslie speaker. And I think it was uh, and I don't recall what song it was, if it was a revolver song or not. Uh, didn't Jeff Ember kind of um, um, Jerry Reagan amp into a, being a big microphone? Um, and I don't recall what song that was, but something about using the speakers of the of some sort of a. Um, technique of using the, the the amp to act as more of the microphone uh I was reading something about that yeah yeah so uh, that also was uh uh had to be what helped push revolver uh to where it was um as for the perception of the general public changing not only to Revolver, but changing away from it seems as though Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And now you hear less and less people mentioning that as the greatest album. It's Revolver. It's the White Album. Some people even go in with Rubber Soul. Um, any thoughts on why Revolver has, over the decades, in people's minds, is more significant musically, just musically, than Sgt. Pepper? I could give you my theory. <laughs> That's what we're I here for. <laughs> <laughs> this is just my opinion here, but uh, I've been saying for a while that for several decades now, there has been more of a movement towards less production, more of a pure sound, more of a raw sound, um, going away from very layered productions like Sgt. Pepper was. And even though the Beatles were experimenting with a lot of different sounds on Revolver, they still sounded like a band. You know, you still heard them playing all their instruments and um, it's a much more raw sound, even though they still did a lot production wise there, not nearly what they did in Sgt. Pepper. I think we've kind of drifted away from the Pepper type albums no matter what pepper will always get a ton of respect but at this moment you know the music industry is very trendy but i think this has been going on for for quite a while sometimes i think and again my opinion here 
ever since the 90s and we've had shows like unplugged be so popular and you've had a lot of the the grunge 90s bands from seattle be very big more people young people are liking that kind of thing um simplicity raw sounds just the band the way it is no frills not um not the big production that sergeant pepper was I think no matter what, in the history books, Sergeant Pepper will always be respected. And who knows, maybe five years from now, 10 years from now, people are going to be really respecting Sergeant Pepper more than the rest of the, the Beatles albums. You never know, really. But if you like that kind of sound, then you're more likely to like the White Album. If you like Revolver, you definitely like the White Album. Back to Basics with the Beatles. You'll like Get Back, Let It Be, those sessions. You'll turn away from Sergeant Pepper. I don't even, you know, Abbey Road is still the Beatles as a band, despite how elaborate the medley was. Um, Sergeant Pepper was the Beatles doing with a lot of production there. Think about all the layering that was done on uh, Within You, Without You, mixing uh, Indian instruments with Western instruments, string instruments there, A Day in the Life all the work that was done on being for the benefit of Mr. Kite to get all the sounds that were done there. And yeah, you still had more simple productions like getting better and fixing a hole, but um, Sergeant Pepper, the title track and all the brass instruments and everything. I think that at the moment, as much as I love that music, the public kind of has drifted away from that. Um, maybe that'll change. Again, this is my opinion here. I think the Revolver is a stronger batch of songs than Sgt. Pepper, period. Uh, whereas Sgt. Pepper add the studio innovations, add the uh, artistic innovations with the packaging uh, and the whole, the whole package, the whole shebang is what put Sgt. Pepper above them all. But as for quality of songs, um, straight through, I think Revolver is the better of the two albums, even with Sgt. Pepper having things like A Day in the Life, and Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, with a little help from my friends and she's leaving home. Um, I love the songs, but Fixing a Hole, Lovely Rita, When I'm 64 versus some of the powerhouses on Revolver, on, on Revolver, you know. Um, I just think it's a, it's a tight, concise, Brilliant, innovative power pop album also um, is, is really the only reason why I feel like people have gravitated to, uh, to, to Revolver. Alan, any? I don't know. I mean, I, I, you know, I've always said when asked what my favorite Beatles album was, I've always said Pepper. And I feel... If I were to now say Revolver, I would be like uh, you know, sort of giving into the moment, but I don't necessarily want to do that. But I see what you're saying uh, on a on a song by song basis. Um, Revolver is an extremely strong album. But on the other hand, I like Within You Without You better than I like Love You Too, if we're going to compare the um Indian bass tracks. If we're going to look at Ringo tracks, I kind of like with a little help from my friends more than Yellow Submarine. Yellow Submarine is a lot of fun, um, but I think I like uh, with a little help from my friends more as a song. Um, so, you know, you can make that argument either way. The, the thing is, um, I have, in reality, I have trouble distinguishing one Beatles album is being better than the others. Um, I'm, and, and that changes a bit over the years. I mean, I've also always said that my least favorite one was Beatles for Sale, and I'm not sure that's true now. Um, probably now my least favorite one is Please Please Me, because it's getting so far back in time yeah. that it's beginning to seem a little primitive, you know, yeah. recorded on two track and... Um, you know, the large number of covers, same as with the Beatles, but with the Beatles seems stronger mm -hmm. uh, on the originals. Um, but with with Please Please Me, 
I listen mainly to the originals on that now. And even there, you know, it really could boil it down to I saw her standing there and please, please me. You know? Dare I say that's the one album I think that sounds dated. It does it's, say, because yeah. it's so far off. And strangely and enough, with the Beatles, doesn't sound dated in quite the same way. Right. Um, but I used to say that okay, you know, from Revolve, from 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 Rubber Soul on, this is you know the Beatles' mature period, and every single one of them is great. And I would don't really want to have to distinguish, you know, which one is better and which one is worse. But then you go back, you know. And in fact, I said that to Mark Lewis, and he he argued it. He said, well, you know, I don't think I don't think that albums before Rubber Soul have you know, are, are poor relations in any way. And if you think about it, I mean, Hard Day's Night's a brilliant album, yeah. it's all original, you know. Um, so, you know, and 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 help too, really, if, if you look at it, uh, you know, I mean, hell, it has yesterday on it, for God's sake, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when, when I was reviewing the, the White Album reissue and really spending a lot of time with it and listening to it in surround and all that stuff, I really was beginning to think, you know, actually, maybe this is my favorite Beatles album, you know, just because there's so much, so much on there. There's so much on all of them, you know, like there really is no bad album. And, you know, yeah. you know. Definitely, if you want to take the, you know, mature point of view, you know, with mature Beatles from, from Rubber Soul onwards, every single one of those is a progression. And, uh, you know, there's, I, 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 I really am reluctant to say that Revolver is the best of them, but that's not to say that I don't think it's a spectacular album. It, it really is. It's also a summarization, I think. I'm sorry, Ken, I just... Uh, it's a summarization of the Beatles um, growing musically because there were songs on there that you could thread backwards to Rubber Soul, um, something like um, For No One or Eleanor Rigby. Mm -hmm. um, but yet there's plenty of indications of what was to come. Love You Too, uh, Tomorrow Never Knows, etc. Um, and that could also be in that it plays maybe to some folks like a sampler of the early Beatles merging with what we are going to become, what, what will become known as the later Beatles, the psychedelic Beatles. They come together, those two worlds, for that one moment equally, and it's on Revolver. There'll be another thing that has raised its appeal over the recent decades. Ken, I'm sorry. No, you just reminded me of the show that we did recently that was our listener suggestion that Beatles albums, if you listen to the tracks on them, there'll be songs that might have fit the previous album and songs mm -hmm. that they know what was to come. But, you know, yeah. at the risk of, of sounding like a cracked record, <laughs> whether or not music sounds dated has no effect as to whether or not I still like it. Um, and... Uh, you know, I know a lot of people have said to me the early Beatles stuff sounds dated. Still, it's strong music. And um, a, a thing about Sgt. Pepper that we've heard all along is that, you know, it was grouped into that year 1967, which was such a big year in rock and roll. And it was the, the birth of conceptual albums and all. And so... Um, Sgt. Pepper's received a, a, a ton of credit, even though really the songs have very little to do with each other as a concept telling a story. But 1967 has been a dividing line for the longest time in radio of what classic rock stations will play and what they won't play. It's one thing when you have a, a weekend Beatles show and they'll play anything from the Beatles, even if it's early stuff. But normally throughout the week, and even now, because they play very little 60s and even less 70s, it starts with 1967. You don't really hear music that predates 1967. Yeah. So, but I have noticed, as we pointed out in the last several decades, how much more respect Revolver has been given. And I do believe there has been a fatigue factor with Sgt. Pepper. A Day in the Life has played so much, Lucy and yeah. the Sky. 
Diamonds so much. The title track to Sgt. Pepper into With a Little Help from My Friends. As great as those songs are, you know, the public can get tired of the same ones. I wish they'd play other songs than Sgt. Pepper, you know, other than the same ones over and over again. But over, overall, I think that Revolver is an album that, for me, really blows me away because it was the biggest creative leap from one album to another, from Rubber Soul to Revolver. And it was still a leap to go from Revolver to Sgt. Pepper. But as someone who really appreciates when artists branch out and explore so many different genres of music, Revolver is just a totally <laughs> such an impressive body of work with where the Beatles were going from the classical sounds of Eleanor Rigby and for no one to psychedelic music from she said, she said to tomorrow never knows to the Indian music to go from Norwegian wood, <laughs> you know, into love you to a full blown Indian song. Mm -hmm. See the progression in George Harrison as a songwriter um it's it's amazing you know i also think and we can debate this but when you think about revolver and the and the songs that impress you the most you can a lot of fans will say all of them but and this is not meant to be disrespectful to yellow submarine that was the big hit from the album you know and eleanor rigby was the flip side and it got a lot of airplay too but do you think that was the best representation for Revolver to signal the change of what the Beatles were doing, Yellow Submarine. Who could argue the fact that it went to number two it was a big hit, no doubt about it. But if something like, I don't know, I can't see Tomorrow Never Knows as a single. She said she the, <laughs> I know what it's like to be dead at, on, on Top 40 Radio. Mm -hmm. But, um, I don't know, and your bird can sing, even though it was on yesterday and today, I know. But there, there are other songs, I think, that would better represent the growth of the band than Yellow Submarine, despite all the different sound effects that they used on the song. And I love Yellow Submarine, don't get me wrong. But I think that might that might have hurt the public's perception of the album overall. Hmm. And, and like we said, if you're brought up on the American album, big difference between that and the UK album. Yeah. I think Yellow Submarine was a safe pick. So was Eleanor Rigby to an extent for choice of singles because they actually were technically considered the A side, double A side, I think, really, which I never quite understood what single release was declared. This shall be a double A side. Mm -hmm. Not this one, though. And how that was handled, because by the time I was following Billboard, A's and B-sides were very much different. Mm -hmm. um, those were two songs that were safe, Eleanor Rigby and Yellow Submarine, to put out as singles. At a time when singles tended not to come from albums all the time. That's a little confusing. The single existed separate from the album. But in this case, they were safe picks. But yeah, they probably weren't the best representation. Maybe Eleanor Rigby, but not Yellow Submarine. Hmm. The best representation of what Revolver was all about. Um, I, uh, I've, this has nothing to do with Revolver, but on that singles topic, you know, I've told a few people this over the years. That it's pretty fascinating that you talk about how big of an album Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band is. No hits, no singles. Mm -hmm. And just a month and a half after Sgt. Pepper comes out, then comes the single. All You Need Is Love. The Beatles have moved on. The album's old now. Here's our new single. Mm -hmm. And it might musically sound similar, but it has nothing to do with the album that's now, oh, that's, you know, that's from last month. Right. Uh, and people don't know that today and find it fascinating that, you know, the White Album didn't have any singles. Maybe I'm Amazed was not a hit until it came out in live form from Wings. I'm getting off topic here, but you mentioned singles and what I've always wondered how they decided back in the day, a double A side or just simple. This is the A, this is the B. But a good point there with maybe not the strongest single coming out to represent the album. Mm -hmm. You know, when you consider the fact that in 1976, when the compilation of rock and roll music came right. out, got to get you into my life was released as a single went top 10 mm -hmm. 
would yep. that have been a better choice in 1966 coming out of Revolver? Possibly. Yeah, it probably would have been as big a hit. Maybe it was pretty big in 76. Maybe it would have been bigger in 66. Mm. Um, hmm. Interesting. I have a, a I guess, semi-amusing Revolver-related story. Um, on For No One, the soloist playing the French horn is a guy named Alan Civil. Alan Civil was like one of the great British French horn players. I mean, he's he made a, a great recording of Mozart concertos and um, Benjamin Britten, all, all kinds of really good stuff. If you're if you follow classical music, you run into Alan Civil. Uh, you know, is is really sort of the top of the horn world. Um, when he died. Um, <clears throat> I was asked to do his obit at the times and, you know, naturally, you know, I know both sides of Alan Civil. And so um, just because he is so important on revolver um, I mentioned that and, 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 and said something like, you know, for all the stuff he's done for a lot of people, he's best known for like, you know, 17 seconds or however long it was, I timed it when I was writing the obit uh, and I took the quote from him from Mark Lewison's book where he said, you know, I'll be walking through an airport and people will come up to me and and they won't say, wow, I really love your Mozart concertos. They say, I really love what you did done for no one. So, you know, I put that in. He said it. It's a quote. It's, you know, his his appearance was definitely an important thing, um, certainly in the pop world. And it definitely got him a lot of recognition that, you know, people who would never have heard of him now heard of him. I walked into the paper <laughs> the next day when the obit came out in the paper and, and ran into one of my editors who just said, you have totally distorted that guy's life. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, Alan Civil, if I did that, but I don't think I did really. That's what happens when you're when you're just in the Beatles orbit for one second. You could be known for that more than anything else. Look at um, David Mason. David Mason, right? Yeah, trumpet solo in Penny Lane, and he played on some other Beatles songs too. I'm pretty sure he's on. Um, Magical Mystery Tour, maybe, and All You Need Is Love in the Brass. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, he'll always be known for Penny Lane. And for uh, Feeling All Right, and, um, being that, a member yeah. of Traffic. Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I guess uh, we've uh, revolved around Revolver here. Now we have to see what could be potentially an incredibly exciting box set, if, if in fact it does happen kind of odd that the past box sets that have come out usually come with a little early buzz, a little factual buzz where you get the sense, oh, this is definitely happening. And maybe a rumor leaks out. Some Giles Martin's been working on this uh, a year in advance. The revolver box set seems to, if this is happening, seems to have come out of nowhere. That there was no leak. There was no rumor that came out. Giles wasn't seen leaving, whatever, Abbey Road, you know. Um, so I'm a little skeptical of if this is real, but uh, boy, it could be. It could be one. You know, the way when we reviewed and talked about the Let It Be box set, we liked it, but there were some butts in there. And the same with Abbey Road, it's wonderful, but. I don't think there's going to be too many butts in what they could possibly do with Revolver in a box set. I can't wait to hear the surround mix of Revolver. That's going to be... Uh... The Dolby Atmos 5.1 and a half mm -hmm. surround sound quadraphonic mix. But at least in these box sets, they give you a Blu-ray where you can get, you know, uh, multiple channels. So that'll be cool to have. All right. Well, Roll that's go to Allen's house. Hmm? Listen to it. Roll road trip. House. Road trip to Allen's house. Yep. Al Allen's wife and the cats would be thrilled if we did that, but they would be. The cats. I, I, the cats would enjoy the company coming over. They 
-hmm. new laps to sit in. Yep. <laughs> I'm wondering, you know, beyond the remix, you're probably going to get a disc of alternate takes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, if we don't know if there's more than a disc worth and probably a mono version again, remastered. It would probably be, I would think it would be like, uh, you'd get a lot of those, um, uh, oh, the, oh, the, the, the description just escaped me. A lot of uh, works in progress tracks cherry picked for, you know, to give you an idea of the stages of how the songs were built in the studio. But yeah, you're not going to get any of the, uh, uh, you know, studio outtakes. We've heard it all, you know, like, uh, you know, some of the other box sets has stuff that never officially came out. Songs that never officially came out. Well, I will say that for me personally, when the Beatles anthology CDs came out on volume two, the absolute highlight for me was take one of tomorrow never knows mm -hmm. take one of got to get you into my life back to yeah. back. And those are really fascinating. And, you know, Apple's been pretty um, clever not to duplicate what they put on the anthology box sets to put them in the, in, in the archival box sets. So, and I love that acoustic version of um, I'm Only Sleeping. That's killer. Right. Mm -hmm. And just the backing tracks, the strings of Eleanor Rigby. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to see if they're, if they're going to, you know, duplicate that. I hope not, but, you know, still belongs. Well, there. yeah. I mean, I think some repetition in these instances is necessary because, the, you know, these are takes that need to be, you know, maybe put things into context. You got to hear it again, you know, mm. uh, even though it came out already once it has a place here. Uh, so you can have it with everything else as opposed to having to go run and get Anthology 2 or something to compare. But um, anyway, so there's Revolver, my friends, uh, from the minds of things we said today. Um, so I guess we'll go around and um, give our farewell speeches and uh, what we're doing, appearances we're making, how much time's left in our probation and all that other stuff. We'll start with Ken. Okay. My other uh, podcast show called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. We just did a show on George Harrison's Live in Japan, the actual tour itself and the double CD that came out for it. Um, that's on our YouTube channel, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, and all of our audio outlets. It's on every single platform. Um, our next show is going to be an interview with Owen Ling. He has just written a new book. Let's see if I can find it here. Should be right here. George Harrison in the 70s. And he gives his own analysis oh, okay. of George's albums from that decade. And um, so everybody on the show, Kid O'Toole, Tom Hunyadi, and Joe Mayo and myself will be asking him questions about everything that's in that book. And that's coming up. Um, actually, <laughs> this is something different. We're pre-taping that show. It won't actually be a live show. We're going to be recording it this coming Sunday. But it should be up on our YouTube channel on monday night okay um and as a matter of fact on my own youtube channel ken michaels radio i just did an interview with owen talking about that book so anytime that i interview somebody more than once for the podcast and for my own channel i always save questions for the other interviews so not everything is just repeating what was in the first show that so, book is uh, that book's part of a series that's decades is it not right right because they there was a, a a pink floyd book a couple of years ago pink floyd in the 1970s mm -hmm. that was a of the deck from the decade series All right. right as you were yeah and owen's been a guest on my on my channel for several shows we just did one in defense of two paul mccartney songs that have been maligned a lot mary had a little lamb and we all stand together. Um, and I just recently did a show that proved to be extremely popular. Should have been singles part two. Uh, 
I did a show with the Talk More Talk gang, and we went through the first show was singles, songs that you felt should have been released as singles in the United States by the Beatles as a group that weren't, that you really felt could have been big hits, not just personal favorites of yours. I know Alan wanted Revolution number nine. It wasn't going to happen. But songs that would make sense that you think, you know, for all the hits the Beatles had and they had plenty in the 60s, they could have had easily twice as many, in my opinion. So we did a show on that. And so the most recent one, part two, we went into the 70s and we all picked 10 solo songs from the 70s that weren't released in the United States specifically as singles. And we we explained why we felt they would have been hits. So again, that's on uh, Talk More Talk. <clears throat> oh, no, that's on my Ken Michaels radio. You so can't much even keep here. up with it. I can't. That's Ken Michaels radio. Please subscribe. And by the way, thank you, thank you, thank you to all the people watching my channel. Just made it to a thousand subscribers. I can't thank you enough. And let's keep it going. More great uh, interviews are coming your way. On uh, my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, you always have Beatles trivia every single week where you can we can win one of 10 great prizes. And since I just did an interview with Jay Bergen, who was John Lennon's defense attorney in the uh, copyright infringement case in court between mobster Morris Levy and John Lennon over uh, using Here Come a Flat Top. Really wasn't in Chuck Berry's song. It was Here Come a Flat Top, I think it was. Um, but that resulted in a whole court case. And it's all covered in this book. And I have this now as a prize to give away on my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. And Jay himself has autographed every copy. Okay. And you can watch an interview that I did with Jay on on my channel, Ken Michaels Radio. And in fact, a couple of days ago for the Fest for Beatle fans in Chicago, I did another interview with Jay, but virtually. And that was a lot of fun with a lot of fans listening and watching to that one. So uh, that is just about everything for me. All right, Thanks. Alan, as, uh, as the calendar is getting ever so closer to the publication of the McCartney Legacy Volume 1. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Hit us with uh, I should say your in, stuff. In my defense, um, John Lennon also thought Revolution Number no. Nine should be a single. So, you know, great minds. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm under house arrest, sort of. I mean, I'm working on Volume Two, and uh, so I'm not going anywhere. Um, <clears throat> You can reach me on Facebook, either under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, or uh, McCartney Legacy has a Facebook page now, too, and so do we. Um, so you can find me all over the place. Um, our Facebook pages are Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio <laughs> Fans. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I'm uncut. My butt is hurting me in this chair. And I, I can't take it anymore. So I had to move. All right. <laughs> Sorry, Alan, as you were. Ignore my butt. So um, things we said today, Beatles radio fans, and just plain old things we said today. You can reach all of us uh, by email at ready for this very long name. Things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Um, we get some interesting email from people. We get um uh, show ideas and, um, you know, arguments about this and that, or um, things, you know, uh, some interesting stuff. Uh, so feel free to write us. Uh, so let's see, I did Facebook. I did. Oh, we also have a Twitter page, a uh, Twitter feed at things we said fab. And, um, that's probably all the ways to reach us. Uh, you can, we hope you're watching the YouTube version of this because it's video and you can see, you know, revolver album getting held up, uh, stuff like that. Um, uh, 105,000 of you have watched the uh, Peter Jackson interview. Um, that obviously is our most popular one by far. Um, so thanks for um, thanks for getting it over the hundred thousand mark. And uh, um, 
all of the shows are up there. A lot of them are just straight audio. Um, it's only been um, last several months we've been doing video too, um, but they're there to listen to. There's some great stuff um, going way back uh, before I joined even uh, and before Darren. Um, when it was um, Ken and Steve Marinucci, they had some great guests, great interviews. Uh, those are still worth listening to. Um, so feel free to go rummaging through. And uh, also we're on Podbean and iTunes and iHeartRadio and all kinds of other places. So if you want to listen to any of these old shows, they're all out there. And uh, yeah, have a ball binge watch things we said today and yeah and then when you're done the seasons will have changed it'll be like the yeah, now darren's gonna stay outside for all the rest of well the, i mean we had when comments. it gets to be winter he's gonna have icicles i should i should time. actually see how 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 late in the season i could bear sitting out here <laughs> um we did have and i do apologize for this actually we did get a comment about lighting issues and i know for a fact that i've had some problems uh, with my primitive setup here, um, including the day that I decided it would be have a nice backdrop to go by a certain window in my house, not taking into consideration that the sun sets. And uh, by the time we got started recording the show, uh, all of a sudden I'm looking, I'm going, I'm really not here anymore because the house is dark. But uh, so I came out here and I'm not guaranteeing I'll be here next time because it might be raining or something, but or it'll be hot and you don't want to see me melt. Anyway, uh, WFUV. Uh, you can uh, reach me at Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. You want to send me a personal email. Uh, better, better bet is really to go to Facebook. I've got two Facebook pages. Darren DeVivo. Another one, which is Darren DeVivo. Uh, WFUV DJ Beetle Podcaster. Something like that. A longer title. Find one of them and I'll hook you up on the other. They're very similar, though. That's always the best place to find me is Facebook. Um, and as for listening to WFUV, which I uh, uh, invite you to do it, we're a very much cutting-edge station emphasizing lots of new music. Uh, you can uh, listen to me Monday through Thursday night starting at 10 p.m. till 2 in the morning and Saturday afternoons from 1 o'clock until 4. So uh, that's my deal at WFUV, which is at 90.7 FM in the New York City area. Um, or you could uh, stream us at WFUV.org or get our app and listen to us on our app. I don't have a smart speaker, so I'm not 100% certain how those things work. But also from what I've been told, if you asked your smart speaker to play FUV, it would know what you're talking about. And that's my spiel. And that's our show on Revolver, Things We Said Today. Thank you so much to everyone for spending time with us. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with a new show. Uh, and uh, for Ken, for Alan, I'm Darren DeVivo saying peace and love. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Bye.